Escobar, sobornando a la policía, sobornando los controles de aduana, dándoles a los dinero. Y si se oponía, les decía, usted verán que escoge, el dinero que le estoy ofreciendo, o en ese camión que hay allá, ese viene lleno de hombres. En el camión vienen 15, más armados que usted, nada más pues que decida. Pablo Escobar, dead drug baron, is still seen by many Colombians as a hero. It is said that at the height of his power, Colombian drug lord Pablo Escobar was the seventh richest man on the planet, his Medellin cartel controlling 80% of the global cocaine market. But it's thought that he only became history's most successful drug trafficker by bribing, killing, or kidnapping anyone who stood in his way in the 1980s and early 90s. 20 years ago, he was gunned down on a rooftop in Medellin, but two decades after his death, he's still making money. What's the story of this man? And how did he become a Colombian drug lord? Here's what you need to know about Pablo Escobar. Before we begin, make sure to smash the like button, subscribe to our channel, and click the notification bell for more amazing videos. Pablo Escobar came from humble origins. Escobar was born on December 1, 1949, in the Colombian city of Rio Negro, Antiquia. His family later moved to the suburb of Envigado. Escobar came from a modest family. His father worked as a peasant farmer while his mother was a school teacher. From an early age, Escobar packed a unique ambition to raise himself up from his humble beginnings. He reportedly began his life of crime early, stealing tombstones and selling phony diplomas. It wasn't long before he started stealing cars, then moving into the smuggling business. Escobar's early prominence came during the Marlboro Wars, in which he played a high-profile war in the control of Colombia's smuggled cigarette market. This episode proved to be a valuable training ground for the future narcotics kingpin. In the mid-1970s, he helped found the crime organization that later became known as the Medellin Cartel. His notable partners included the Ochoa brothers. Juan, David, George Lewis, and Fabio. Escobar served as the head of the organization, which largely focused on the production, transport, and sale of cocaine. Medellin Cartel and Rise to Power It wasn't by chance that Colombia came to dominate the cocaine trade. Beginning in the early 1970s, the country became a prime smuggling ground for marijuana. But as soon as the cocaine market flourished, Colombia's geographical location proved to be its biggest asset. Situated at the northern tip of South America, between the thriving coca cultivation epicenters of Peru and Bolivia, the country came to dominate the global cocaine trade with the United States, the biggest market for the drug just a short trip to the north. Escobar moved quickly to grab control of the cocaine trade. In 1975, drug trafficker Fabio Restrepo from the city of Medellin, Colombia was murdered. His killing, it's believed, came at the orders of Escobar who immediately seized power and expanded Restrepo's operation into something the world had never seen. Under Escobar's leadership, large amounts of coca paste were purchased in Bolivia and Peru, processed and transported to America. Escobar worked with a small group to form the infamous Medellin Cartel. As a young man, Escobar told his friends and family that he wanted to become president of Colombia. Yet, as he saw it, his path to wealth and legitimacy lay in crime. In 1982, Escobar was elected as an alternate member of Colombia's Congress. But the reasons for his wealth could not stay hidden, and two years after his election, he was forced to resign. The justice minister who revealed Escobar's notorious background was later slain. By the mid-1980s, Escobar had an estimated net worth of $30 billion and was named one of the 10 richest people on earth by Forbes. Cash was so prevalent that Escobar purchased a Learjet for the sole purpose of flying his money. At the time, Escobar controlled more than 80% of the cocaine smuggled into the US. More than 15 tons were reportedly smuggled each day, netting the Medellin cartel as much as $420 million a week. As the leader of the Medellin cartel, Escobar quickly became legendary for his ruthlessness, and an increasing number of politicians, judges, and policemen publicly opposed him. Escobar had a way of dealing with his enemies. He called it plato o pomo, silver or lead. If a politician, judge, or policeman got in his way, he would almost always first attempt to bribe him or her. 
If that didn't work, he would order the person to be killed, occasionally including the victim's family in the hit. The exact number of men and women killed by Escobar is unknown, but it certainly goes well into the hundreds and possibly into the thousands. Social status did not matter to Escobar. If he wanted you out of the way, he'd get you out of the way. He ordered the assassination of presidential candidates and was even rumored to be behind the 1985 attack on the Supreme Court, carried out by the 19th of April insurrectionist movement, in which several Supreme Court justices were killed. On November 27, 1989, Escobar's cartel planted a bomb on Avancia Flight 203, killing 110 people. The target, a presidential candidate, was not actually on board. In addition to these high-profile assassinations, Escobar and his organization were responsible for the deaths of countless magistrates, journalists, policemen, and even criminals inside his own organization. Height of his power By the mid-1980s, Escobar was one of the most powerful men in the world. His empire included an army of soldiers and criminals, a private zoo, mansions, and apartments all over Colombia private airstrips, and planes for drug transport, and personal wealth reported to be in the neighborhood of $24 billion. Escobar could order the murder of anyone, anywhere, anytime. He was a brilliant criminal, and he knew that he would be safer if the common people of Medellin loved him. Therefore, he spent millions on parks, schools, stadiums, churches, and even housing for the poorest of Medellin's inhabitants. His strategy worked. Escobar was beloved by the common people, who saw him as a local boy who had done well and was giving back to his community. In some ways, he positioned himself as a Robin Hood-like figure. In June 1991, Escobar surrendered to the Colombian government of President Cesar Guevara. In return, the threat of extradition was lifted, and Escobar was allowed to build his own luxury prison called La Catedral, which was guarded by men he handpicked among his employees. The prison lived up to its name and came complete with a casino, spa, and nightclub. In June 1992, however, Escobar escaped when authorities attempted to move him to a more standard holding facility. A manhunt for the drug lord was launched that would last 16 months. During that time, the monopoly of the Medellin cartel, which began to crumble during Escobar's imprisonment as police raided offices and killed its leaders, rapidly deteriorated. Death. On December 2, 1993, Colombian security forces, using U.S. technology, located Escobar hiding in a home in a middle-class section of Medellin. The search block moved in, triangulated his position, and attempted to bring him into custody. Escobar fought back, however, and there was a shootout. Escobar was eventually gunned down as he attempted to escape on the rooftop. Although he was shot in the torso and leg, the fatal wound passed through his ear leading many to believe that Escobar committed suicide. Others believe one of the Colombian policemen fired the bullet. Today, Escobar's son is a motivational speaker who goes by the name Sebastian Marroquin. Marroquin studied architecture and published a book in 2015, Pablo Escobar, My Father, which tells the story of growing up with the world's most notorious drug kingpin. He also asserts that his father had committed suicide. My father's not a person to be intimidated. Marokin said in an Agent France press review, he showed us the path we must never take as a society because it's the path to self-destruction, the loss of values, and a place where life ceases to have importance. With Escobar gone, the Medellin cartel quickly lost power to its rival, the Cali cartel, which dominated until the Colombian government shut it down in the mid-1990s. Escobar is still remembered by the poor of Medellin as a benefactor. He has been the subject of numerous books, movies, and television series, including Narcos and Escobar, Paradise Lost. Many people remain fascinated by the master criminal, who once ruled one of the largest drug empires in history. That's it for today's video. Don't forget to smash that like button, share this video with your friends, and tell us what you want to see next in the comments section below.